Natasha, and yes, this is Kids ENT Health Month, and today we'll be doing a review of pediatric ears, nose, and throat conditions and their treatments. So, like I mentioned, this is Kids ENT Health Month, and statistically, we have seen that pediatric ears, nose, and throat disorders uh, remain among the primary reasons children will visit physicians and their pediatricians with ear infections ranking number one in that category especially this year with all these viruses running rampantly, um, all these viruses running rampant, those viruses will lead eventually downstream to ear infections, and we'll get more to that into that in a little bit. So a little bit about me. I am originally from Akron, Ohio. I went to Ohio State for undergrad and then Ohio University for medical school. I did my, most of my training in Philadelphia and my pediatric ENT fellowship at UC San Diego. So I'm board certified in ENT and then uh, before coming here, I actually spent three years at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia before moving to Tahoe in 2020. Uh, separately, I'm a peer reviewer for the Ears, Nose, and Throat Journal, as well as the International Journal of Pediatric Otolaryngology. Uh, and previously, when I was in Philadelphia, I was an associate professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Drexel University College of Medicine. So what is ENT? It's like a sinus doctor or something, right? Well, ENT stands for ears, nose, and throats, and I think our specialty may have the most names for it, specialty. A specialty in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, uh, head and neck surgeon, snot guy, booger guy. There's lots of different ways we can describe it, but what we take care of are most of the things in the head and neck, but not including the brain, spine, and eyeballs. There's different specialties for that. Uh, we deal with many issues, including ear infections, tonsil and sinus issues, allergy issues, hearing problems head and neck cancers and masses, voice issues and uh, nose issues. So within ENT, which is a specialty by itself, there's actually subspecializations. Uh, pediatric ENT is actually just one of those specialties, but rhinology and sinus surgery is another one. Head and neck cancer surgery is another um, subspecialty, as well as ear surgery, facial plastics, and voice box disorders. When we talk about the ears, let's we have to first review some ear anatomy. Um, Normally, sound comes in through the ear canal and it vibrates the eardrum. The eardrum separates the ear canal from the middle ear. And once the sound vibration hits the eardrum, the vibration is sent through three tiny little bones called, called ossicles, like a chain reaction. And that last ossicle is called the stapes and the stapes sends the vibration through the cochlea, into the cochlea. Sound is processed into the cochlea and from there it goes into the brain via the nerve. Um, so, that's how sound is processed. Now the middle ear is connected to the back of the nose via the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube is the thing that pops our ears with elevation changes, with going up and down hills and with flying. And really the eustachian tube is the root cause of most middle ear problems. When the eustachian tube is working, pressure um, is, equal, is equal between the middle ear and the back of the nose. But when it's not working, that's when you get ear pressure, uh, fullness, and sometimes fluid buildup. Middle ear infections are much more common in children, uh, mainly because the eustachian tube is horizontal and it, it's, it, it's at a more horizontal angle and it's smaller as compared to adults where the angle, it, it's more of an angle and it's bigger. But because uh, children have these smaller eustachian tubes, every time they have an infection, every time they get a cold, um, that cold can go into their ears and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Separately, uh, the adenoids, that's just like the tonsils, but you can't see them because they're in the back of the nose. This is looking at your nose from a side view. And the adenoids, um, they, when they're big, they can crowd that eustachian tube opening. And furthermore, those adenoids can harbor bacteria that go straight up that eustachian tube, thereby getting into the middle ear and sometimes causing ear infections. We'll touch more about this um, in a little bit as well, but really the main th point I'm trying to make is the, eust the eustachian tube is the main root cause of all ear infections. When we talk about hearing loss, um, again, we kind of touched upon before, there's really two kinds of hearing loss, conductive hearing loss and nerve-related hearing loss. When we talk about conductive hearing loss, uh, that's usually sound is, not con sound is not conducting because something is blocking it. Maybe there's a bunch of fluid in the ear from an ear infection. Uh, maybe there's a problem with these three little bones, and these three little bones are very tiny. If I was holding them in, my, in the palm of my hand, you'd struggle to see them. But sometimes we see discontinuities between the bones, 
sometimes the bones are so um, they're so fixed and firm that they don't move at all. And then separately, imagine you had a big hole in the eardrum. Well, sound's going to have difficulty um, uh, sending its vibration through that structure, through that mechanism, and there's a hole. Separately, nerve-related hearing loss is a totally different category, and there's no problems with the conduction. But when sound gets to the cochlea and it goes to the brain via the nerve, there's the nerve. If the nerve is affected, you can have a severe to profound sensorial hearing loss. There's different things that can cause this infection. It can be congenital medications, and sometimes uh, you can have a hearing loss just suddenly. So we, you know, again, being kids in team month, being kids in team month, we've talked about activities that can put children in danger for noise-induced hearing loss, including target shooting, hunting, really anything loud, snowmobile riding, listening to music at too high, uh, too high of a level, um, or playing in a band or attending loud concerts without hearing protection. There's lots of different earplugs and some are, will fully take away all sound. And then there's types of musicians earplugs that only filter out certain sounds. But it's important to be mindful, especially when taking children to loud concerts, that you be aware of their, you know, the, that they are more prone to hearing loss because their ears are still growing. So this is an example of a girl wearing hearing protection at a concert. So middle ear infections, what are they? Um, when we talk about recurrent ear infections, those can be bacterial or viral. And an ear infection for us is simply defined as a red angry eardrum um, that is typically associated with pain and fever. Uh, what typically happens in the typical scenario is that a kid has a cold, most likely viral, and, and like we were talking about this winter, there's been lots of viruses floating around, whether it's been uh, influenza, um, RSV, or coronavirus. Well, what happens with all these infections is that kids generally get a combination of getting a cough, congestion, runny nose. Well, once they start getting congestion, and that congestion will spread to the back of the nose, the eustachian tube opening gets congested. If it cannot equalize like it should, that's when you get a back of pressure into the middle ear. And that middle ear pressure can then turn into fluid. Fluid can turn into um, recurrent ear infections. And so when you have that buildup of fluid, especially when it's infected, that can be painful, which can cause kids to be fussy, which can cause them to have interrupted sleep. And in severe cases, that you can get a ruptured eardrum because that pressure can only, you know, that middle ear space can only take so much pressure and fluid before it can pop a hole right through the eardrum and drain out. That's in severe cases, though. Uh, when we talk about, so there's, you know, like we said, otitis media, that's an ear infection, by the way. And that's where, again, when you have a red, angry eardrum that's infected and you have a fever. You, if you have only fluid in the eardrum, fluid by itself that's not infected is generally not painful. Uh, but however, that fluid can cause muffled hearing because it's, again, affecting that conductive mechanism with which we hear. And, you know, when you have hearing loss from that fluid in the ears, that can sometimes lead to delayed speech and learning. But, but generally it's not too uncomfortable for children only to have fluid and you do not need to treat fluid with antibiotics. However, if it's left, um, I would say 50% of cases of just sterile fluid in the ear that's not infected, they will resolve by one month, 90% will resolve by three months. However, if it's been longer than three months, that's when you can get injury to the hearing bones or the eardrum itself. So what are the risk factors for ear infections? Well, daycare is probably the number one thing we're seeing running around right now. Uh, kids get each other sick, quite frankly, and when they get each other sick, that viral mechanism spreads to the back of the nose. You get that eustachian tube dysfunction, and which leads to the fluid and lots of ear infections. Other things that can affect that eustachian tube, secondhand smoke, allergies, um, having a cleft palate, and certain syndromes such as Down syndrome. Genetic um, eustachian tube dysfunction, there's also some genetics that are involved as well. So what does a normal eardrum look like? These pictures show, well, the appearance of a normal eardrum, kind of like an opaque, an opaque um, appearance. When we, when we talk about fluid in the, in the ear, it's important that we're not actually talking about fluid in the ear canal. It's when we look with an otoscope into the ear canal and we're looking through the eardrum, kind of like looking through a window and we see fluid on the other side. So it takes lots of experience and practice to see what a normal eardrum looks like versus a uh, infected eardrum or a, a eardrum that has fluid behind it. But this, these pictures are of normal eardrums. Now you contrast this to a middle ear infection. These eardrums are bulging with pus behind them. You can see this whitish color. You can see all these blood vessels 
and it's straining. And so you can kind of also imagine when you have a really severe infection, how it'll just burst the hole right through that through the um, eardrum to drain out. Again, those are severe cases. So, and to back up for a second, all ear infections should be treated. Not, I shouldn't say all ear infections, but the majority of ear infections, especially if there's associated fever and, you're, and kids are symptomatic um, with pain, are often treated with antibiotics. So I mentioned middle ear fluid that's not infected. This is an example of what we call a serous effusion. This is leftover fluid that's not infected, but it can be associated with the hearing loss. Here's a picture of, a, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, but that's a, what a hole in the eardrum looks like. And this is an example of severe eustachian tube dysfunction. And I mentioned if the eustachian tube doesn't work, you can get a vacuum of pressure. That pressure is typically a negative type pressure. And if that pressure builds and builds and builds, it'll suck the eardrum in. And in this case, it's sucking in so much that you can, we, it outlines all of the normal structures in the ear. You can see one of the hearing bones here. The nerve to our face runs right in the middle ear as well. And that's an important thing to note as well. The, the middle ear is close, right next to our brain, right next to our balance centers, and the nerve that controls our facial functions runs right through the middle. In severe ear infections, all of those can be affected in rare cases. But this is an example, again, if that, if that uh, eardrum is so, has so much negative pressure, it can get sucked in, which can lead to hearing loss. So when should you, should, when should you uh, see an ENT specialist? Typically, patients are referred to me if they've had lots of ear infections and they've had, you know, they basically had lots of ear antibiotics. Uh, the typical criteria we use for ear tubes, which we'll talk about in a, set, in a little bit, are three distinct ear infections in six months or four in 12 months. Uh, other scenarios are high-risk children with middle ear fluid. Um, and really, when we talk about high-risk children, these are children that have uh, they are already predisposed to having hearing problems, speech problems, or just learning disabilities. So children with Down syndrome, autism, cranial facial disorders like, such as a cleft palate, or patients that have se severe vision impairment. Patients that can't see, they really rely on their hearing. So if they have middle ear fluid, um, they're more suspects, you know, they need their ears to hear. As, and all these other children, they, you know, they are, they are, they're more predisposed to speech and learning disabilities, so they rely on their hearing even more than others. If a fluid effusion, I mentioned generally most of the cases of fluid will go away 90% um, by six months or 90% by three months. But if it's been two to three months and fluid has not gone away and there's an associated hearing loss, uh, we worry about uh, progression to speech and language delays and uh, those patients are often referred to me as well. Also, if there's any concern for any potential complications, if there's a hole in the eardrum, if there's, like we mentioned, the hearing loss or um, signs and symptoms of severe eustachian tube dysfunction, I see those patients as well. So ear tubes, what are they? It's an incision in the eardrum that basically releases the pressure uh, of the middle ear. And I'll have a video coming up that shows how exactly we do that. But what's the advantage of them? Yeah, they reduce the number of ear infections. Not to say you can never get an ear infection again, but statistically, the number of ear infections has been shown to go way down. It also reduces the severity of symptoms. If you have a little escape port or a little hole in the eardrum with, with the tube, then you don't have that same buildup of pressure that causes pain and that fluid just drains out. So typically, if, if a child has ear tubes and they happen to have an ear infection, it basically shows up as asymptomatic ear drainage that can be treated with ear drops and you don't typically need oral antibiotics. So less antibiotics leads to less antibiotic resistance throughout the course of their life. Disadvantages, well, these are typically done in the OR. Uh, sometimes we do them in the office, but it would have to be an older child to do so. Complications are rare, and um, it's, it, this procedure is typically done under anesthesia with mask anesthesia. And one question patients, patients and parents often ask about, like, can my child swim if they have a hole in their ear? in their eardrum via an ear tube? Yes and no. Uh, the, our ENT Academy says there's no restrictions with swimming in clean water, but sometimes I see kids that have that spend a lot of time in the water, they do have some issues with ear tube drainage. Typically for those patients, I just tell them to use earplugs when swimming. Um, but some, some, parents, some parents and patients are able to get away with not using any earplugs at all and swim just fine with ear tubes in. Tubes can fall out too soon, or stay in too long. On average, we expect them to last approximately nine to 18 months. 
but in, in rare cases, they can fall out sooner than we like. In other cases, they can last even longer than we want. And in those cases, we have to actually go remove the, the hole, the, sorry, remove the tube. Um, in less than 3% of cases, when the tube falls out, they can leave a small hole in the eardrum. And in some cases, we have to go and repair that. But 97%, in 97% of cases, the hole will close behind the tube as it comes out. So again, ear tubes, most common pediatric surgery in America. And we talked about some of the indications already. If you have lots of ear infections, if you have fluid that in the ear that's not going away and lasting more than three months, or if you have fluid in the ear in an at-risk um, child, such as in the most common scenario, if there's a child with a speech delay and they have fluid that's affecting their hearing, well, children need to hear well to speak well. So those are good candidates for ear tubes. And uh, if patients have had lots of if they've had lots of ear infections and those and they start developing antibiotic resistance, that's another indication. Here's a picture of what an ear tube looks like, you know, and it's again, it's it's an incision in the eardrum, and we put this one to two millimeter ear tube that sits on the eardrum to basically keep that hole open, to so to provide a space from the middle ear to the outer ear. Here is a video of what the procedure looks like. A linear radial meningotomy is performed in the anterior inferior quadrant to avoid any ossicle injury. An incision is made. This must be just large enough to insert the ventilation tube. Take great care when manipulating this instruments here, so as not to injure the anterior canal wall, causing in, bleeding. Uh, severe cases. This is a thick middle ear effusion is suctioned, especially if it hinders the ventilation tube placement. And Take so you care can imagine, to use a too large suction so as not to induce sound. And so you can imagine when you have this much mucus in your middle ear, you can imagine how that would affect the hearing and why kids after ear tube placement hear better. They start speaking better in some cases and, um, you know, less ear infections. You're clearing that middle ear space out so that uh, even though the kids have the eustachian tube dysfunction that leads to these middle ear infections, once, the, once there's a tube in there, there's no, the middle ear space can breathe. It's not closed off like it was before. So this is an outpatient surgery. It takes, you know, honestly, it, I, it can take a few minutes up to like 15, 20 minutes in smaller ear canals. Seems like half the time is just cleaning out the wax sometimes. These tubes again will last six to 24 months and there's different kinds of tubes. There's ones that are meant to last, you know, like I said, nine to 18 months and there's bigger ones that are meant to last even longer in other cases. So, the pros, it'll decrease infections, it'll allow treatment for it, it, it reduces ear infections, but those ear infections that do happen to occur, uh, they can be treated with ear drops. And I'll be honest, all the tubes I've done since I've been here, I, it, it's been rare where I've had to treat any ear infection with ear tubes once the tubes are in place. But that leads to fewer oral antibiotics, less discomfort for, children, for the child, and especially if they're having any speech delays, oftentimes we see um, patients that start speaking a lot more after they have the tubes in, because they can hear. Um, and complications, we talk about they can fall out soon, they can last, or they can um, stay in too long. We have to go and remove those. Uh, and then a hole in the eardrum we discussed already. We kind of touched upon the water precautions with ear tubes. What I usually tell patients is initially after ear tubes, you don't have to use earplugs with swimming in clean water. But if they ever have one episode of ear drainage after swimming or with some kind of water exposure, from that point forward, I recommend using earplugs. And then also the parents' quality of life improves. That's less trips to the pediatrician, less trips to the urgent cares, less antibiotics, and the, you know, overall a less symptomatic child. All right, so that's the ear infections. And then, you know, I'm just showing some pictures of other ear issues we deal with. The, this picture here is something called microtia, which is a lack of development of the ear. Um, this is a picture. Uh, there's different skin tags babies can be born with that we can surgically remove. This is a picture of a large hole in the eardrum, and um, uh, that can happen, you know, in holes in the eardrum, they can happen from trauma, but I will say 90% of traumatic eardrum perforations, 90% um, of ear, traumatic eardrum perforations will close on their own. So that's, but with these bigger ones, they have to be repaired, which we can do in the OR. And then you have these pictures of, this is a picture of an ear keloid. Some, some patients have a predilection to scarring. And in these cases, we basically just have to go and remove these things. So 
It's a surgery and then we inject steroids afterwards to help prevent them from coming back. This is a picture of a view into the eardrum. And this is actually a middle ear mass called a cholecytoma. It's, it's a sack of essentially skin cells that some patients are born with. And these cholecytomas can slowly erode the hearing bones. So surgery, uh, surgery to remove that is necessary where we lift up the eardrum and we carefully dissect these tumors out, benign tumors. I meant to give a disclosure before I started and uh, it was regarding the fact that we will have several images and videos of some different ENT pathology and surgery. So in case anyone else is, if anyone is squeamish, we have some other videos that it's nothing crazy from my view, but for patients that have never seen this stuff, if, if you don't like the sight of blood, then just be warned. There's very little and it's nothing crazy, but uh, I'm just giving a little disclaimer just in case anyone's squeamish with seeing any um, operation videos. So we're onto the nose. And so when we look at the anatomy of the nose, we, you know, the outer nose, we can all see, obviously. The septum is the wall that divides right and left in our nose. This central picture is a CAT scan looking at uh, someone um, directly at them. And so it's a single shot, but I'll, if you can see my cursor, you can see the eyeballs are right here and the brain is up here. The sinuses are air-filled structures. And so on a CAT scan, sinuses, we, air is black. So we like seeing um, air-filled, we, like, we want our sinuses to be air-filled. So black is good. And you'll see some CAT scans later on where you don't see very much black. But here's some cheek sinuses on the right and left. We have sinuses that line the eyeballs. Those are called the effluents. The septum is the wall that divides right and left in the nose. 90% of the population will have some deviation of the septum. And then we have these little thing, these little shelves of tissue. There's three on each side. These are called the turbulence. These are the things that actually fluctuate in size when you get sick, when you have allergies, colds, congestion, whatnot. Um, and so it, these are the things that change. But the septum doesn't really change unless it's traumatically altered. You know, think nasal fracture or um, getting hit in the face with a baseball because the septum is just made of cartilage and bone. But the, again, these turbulence are the things that get bigger and smaller with colds, congestion, and whatnot. So also when you spray into sprays like Flonase or Afrin in the nose, you're acting to shrink these guys so you can breathe more through the nose. The, uh, you can kind of think of sinuses like rooms, rooms off of the main hallway. The main, you have the right main, the right nasal passage and the left nasal passage, which are again divided by the septum. And the sinuses are kind of like rooms off of the hallway. One thing I want to point out here, and we'll talk about this in a little bit too, the openings into the sinuses are very small, two to three millimeters in some cases. So you can imagine with any cold, any congestion, bad allergies, when you, when you feel that sinus pressure, it doesn't take much to congest the openings. And, um, but, and that's when we talk about viral infections, everyone with, some, with a bad virus, they're gonna feel sinus pain and pressure because those openings get blocked. That doesn't automatically mean you have sinusitis. Uh, a common cold, cough, congestion, runny nose, and then you get these blocked sinuses. But if a sinus stays blocked, for five, six, seven, eight days after a cold starts, that's how a, a viral infection can turn into a bacterial infection. Because if that sinus stays blocked, that becomes a breeding ground for bacteria. And that's where that green yellow stuff starts to kind of percolate and can drain out. The um, separately, the nasopharynx is basically the area all the way in the back of the nose. And that's where the adenoids live. Those are, the adenoids, again, are like your tonsils, but you can't see them because they're all the way in the back of the nose. So what are some common problems in kids with the nose? Well, congestion um, congestion is largely due to most, in most patients because these, these turbulence can, be, can get big in a bad cold or, an, or with allergies. If the adenoids are enlarged, that'll also cause common con, uh, congestion. But we'll talk more about snoring, sinusitis, and nosebleeds. So sinusitis, we mentioned before when we were looking at a CAT scan, we like to see um, areas of black because that black represents air. In this patient, you can see all you see is gray. And this just shows a patient that's completely blocked up with, with um, nasal polyps and mucus. You can see this in a bad infection. Here's another example of that. When you have a sinus infection, uh, the typical symptoms are fever, thick greenish yellow drainage, cough, bad breath, irritability and headaches. And so we treat these with a combination of antibiotics, nasal steroids like Flonase, Nasonex, and um, antihistamines, not as much anymore, but 
and rarely in severe cases, oral steroids. Oral steroids help to reduce inflammation, especially if there's a history of polyps. Polyps are basically uh, physical exam findings of severe inflammation. And so they get, you, you might see them with bad allergies, with, with a really bad cold, and they will also shrink and go away with as the inflammation decreases or with oral steroids. Sinus rinses, you can see an example here. This is a Neil Med sinus rinse that we often prescribe for our patients with bad um, sinus issues. Think of it like a hose for the nose. You're just rinsing out all that mucus that builds up. And so what are some risk factors for sinusitis in children? Well, in children, the, the number one thing is gonna be enlarged adenoids, which is different than adults. In adults, that's a whole separate conversation, but with the children, especially between the ages of two and four years old, their adenoids become pretty big. And when your adenoids are big, they block your nose. What happens if your nose is blocked? Well, those secretions don't really have much, uh, they really don't have a good drainage pathway. They'll often sound like congested. And a lot of times you'll hear them mouth breathing. Sometimes I say like for a child with really big adenoids, it's almost like they're like, a, it's like Darth Vader. Like you'll walk into a room and it's like, you know, because they can't breathe through their nose. Other risk factors in children, um, uh, asthma, the common cold can lead to a sinus infection through the mechanism we already discussed. And children with um, bad allergies, if they have bad allergies, those, those turbinates that we discussed are already so congested and um, that can, that's a risk factor as well. Secondhand smoke, reflux, and the big thing is daycare too. Kids pass around viruses left and right to each other and that can just lead to a common inflammatory cycle. Cystic fibrosis as well as immune problems are also risk factors. So the first line treatment for chronic sinusitis in children, and we're mainly for the most part talking to kids eight and, eight and younger, um, are is it removing the adenoids? And those adenoids, you can see a picture here, they are, is that wad of tissue in the back of the nose. And it's performed through the mouth. Those adenoids can harbor, not besides blocking the back of the nose, they can also harbor bacteria, which leads to recurrent ear infections. Separately for, um, older kids and adults, you know, the adenoids don't have as much of a role. When, then we start talking about endoscopic sinus surgery. Endoscopic sinus surgery is where we actually make those openings into the sinuses bigger. We showed that CAT scan earlier where those openings normally are like pretty small, in some cases, two or three millimeters. We're using a uh, camera and then we're using instruments to widen those uh, openings so that they can basically breathe better. And then when they are more open, you have better access for, for medicine, such as saltwater rinses or other nasal sprays to so actually get into where they need to go. Okay, so here are some other examples um, of sinus pathology. In some cases, we mentioned the sinuses, they're right next to the eye and they're right next to the brain. In severe sinus infections, that infection can actually break through the wall, the boning wall that divides the eye from the sinus and you can get eye swelling. This actually happened with my daughter, which was you know, very interesting for that to happen. Uh, to me as an ENT, because it's overall it's still a rare thing to happen. And in some cases, you know, the, these infections can get in the eye, can cause swelling. A lot, of the, a lot of these cases can be treated with antibiotics alone, but some do require a sinus surgery to um, remove all the diseased tissue in the sinuses. This is an example of this bottom picture of a polyp that's blocking access into the sinus. And um, it's, yeah, that's what a, kind of what a polyp looks like. In sinus surgery, we use different instruments, including shavers, to literally shave that away and remove it and pull all that um, junk out of the sinus so the sinus has more room to breathe. This picture on the right is what it looks like after the fact. The, um, these are sinus openings that are made much wider. There's no polyp visualized. And then this is an opening into the cheek sinus here. This picture up top is a picture of a, something called a juvenile nasal pharyngeal angiofibroma. It's a, very, it's a fairly rare tumor that it's one of its I saw it in Philadelphia, we managed it surgically, but this is a benign vascular tumor that can occlude the back of the nose that also requires surgery. So again, patients can breathe. So what are some common um, mouth and throat treatment, uh, mouth and throat uh, diseases in children? Well, most commonly we refer to patients that have big tonsils, that, big tonsils and adenoids that lead to snoring and sleep apnea, tongue tie, um, patients with large tongues and there's lots of different types of cysts, lumps, and bumps that um, often need to be surgically removed. This is a picture of the mouth, and um, that little dangly thing in the back of the mouth is called the uvula. The tonsils live on the sides here, and 
Typically with the tonsils, uh, we like to see a lot of space in between them. And the more space we see in between them, the better. As you can see in this picture on the bottom, these tonsils are huge and completely blocking the back of the mouth and such that there's no space. These are, we, call, we refer to these as kissing tonsils because they're touching. All right, so what, let's talk about tonsillitis. The tonsils are lumps of lymphoid tissue that are, they're part of the body's immune system, but if they get infected, whether by viruses or bacteria, uh, and the most common being strep, then they can get big. You can get a sore throat, you get fever, you get these white patches on these tonsils we call exudates. Your voice becomes more swollen because you know, they get big and block the back of the mouth. You get a, what we call a hot potato voice. And then you, it's, it's hard to swallow. It's painful to swallow. And if this happens over and over and over, that leads to downstream issues, including missed school, missed work for parents, and missed school activities. And But what happens with recurrent tonsillitis, you know, those, those recurrent infections can lead to bigger and bigger tonsils. And especially when those tonsils start blocking the back of the airway, that's when we have to surgically intervene. So how about sleep? What about sleep apnea? Well, sleep apnea basically is, you know, there's snoring and snoring by itself is not always problematic. But when, when you have snoring with choking, breathing pauses, gasping, those are signs of obstructive sleep apnea. And that affects up to 14% of children in America. So the most common treatment in children for sleep apnea is removing the tonsils to the adenoids. Now left untreated, sleep apnea has a number of problems. You know, physically, it's difficult for these kids to breathe at night. That can lead to poor weight gain, or conversely, in rare cases, obesity, but most of the time it's poor weight gain if it's severe sleep apnea. Um, and because the body is having to work harder to breathe, that puts a harder, more of a strain on the heart and lungs. That could also lead to bedwetting. Psychos and then as far as the other way, we call these daytime symptoms, sleep apnea leads to poor sleep. Well, kids are more irritable if they don't sleep very well. So they're, they lead to, and that leads to more hyperactive behavior decreased attention and learning delays, and sometimes poor school performance. So these are all associations with untreated sleep apnea. Now, this is a video of what a particularly severe episode of sleep apnea looks like. And apnea just basically means a pause in breathing. And an obstructive sleep apnea is defined as a breathing pause 10 seconds or more. So stops breathing here. And I'll warn you, this is a fairly long <laughs> breathing pause. And so not every child's going to be like this. But if you see these breathing pauses lasting a second or two, or they're gasping, or they're seemingly struggle to breathe, um, that's the sign of sleep apnea. And especially in children, that needs to be evaluated by, of course, your pediatrician, and then, and then me if those tonsils are pretty big. So this breathing pause is going on roughly 30 seconds. And again, this is a more, this is, this is a scary version of this happens for that long. And then you finally get to breath in. So, so what's ton tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy? Uh, about 500,000 procedures are performed in the US each year. It's done under general anesthesia with a breathing tube in place. And often this is an outpatient surgery. We talked a little bit about the indications of recurrent tonsil infections or sleep disorder breathing slash snoring with obstructive sleep apnea signs. Some, in rare cases, we will perform tonsillectomy if there's a significant difference in tonsil size. Cancer is fairly rare in children. Hem hemorrhagic tonsillitis is when tonsils spontaneously bleed on their own. That's a, it's a very rare diagnosis, but that's also an indication. So here's a video of what a tonsillectomy looks like. The, uh, the, uh, we use a, something called a catheter to pull back the soft palate and uvula. The breathing tube is here. It, this, this is if we're looking um, straight down at the child's mouth. So imagine the feet are up here and then the top of the head is down here. We use an instrument to retract the tonsil away. And we just use this instrument that kind of, this is called a coblator. And this uses salt water to create a plasma field that melts the, the, um, the plane away. When we say the plane, there's a plane between the tonsil and the underlying musculature. As a surgeon, it's important to stay in that plane and not go too deep so you don't get any bleeding. And generally, it's not, especially in younger children, this, there's not too much, there's always some, a little bit of bleeding, but it's not very much at all in children. And so you can see here, 
That instrument is melting away the plane between the underlying normal tissue and the tonsil. So what I, when I talk to patients about tonsillectomy, I generally tell them it's a seven to 14 day recovery process. Soft food diet for 10 days after surgery, and it's important to drink lots of liquids. Back of the mouth will have that whitish appearance. It'll smell pretty bad because those, those scabs smell bad. And overall, there's a two to three risk Two to three percent risk of bleeding after the surgery. Now, almost in most cases, that bleeding doesn't happen right away. If it's going to happen at all, if it happens at all, it's usually between day five and ten, I would say. Scabs always fall off. Just rarely, rarely with scabs. Um, there's a bleeder, but there can be a bleeder behind those scabs. But again, overall, that's a low risk of two to three percent. They have a sore throat, and um, the pain goes up and down. So the, the younger they are, generally, the better they do. But once those tonsils are out, they can breathe. Especially if that's the reason why we're the tonsils are so big, we're removing that obstruction. Okay, so here's some other examples of other oral lesions. This is a cyst in the mouth. Um, this is uh, this can happen with uh, these are this is these are pictures I have from Philadelphia. We, we dealt with this more in Philadelphia, but these are this is along the path where the spit gland in the neck drains into the mouth. And you can get cysts there that need to be removed. Tongue tie is a increasingly is a problem I'm increasingly seeing more and more in, in this region. Um, we all have this thing here called the frenulum. And sometimes, sometimes in babies, this frenulum can attach too close to the tip of the tongue and restrict tongue movement. When that happens, in some cases, that can lead to issues with breastfeeding. So if you have a, a newborn that's falling off the breast, that's uh, falling asleep easily, it seems to just not be latching well. Or conversely, if you're the mother and it's it's painful to breastfeed, if it's it's painful, maybe possibly leading to um, irritated bleeding um, nipples. Those are other risks. Those are other signs that a child may have tongue tie. And so when we when patients are referred for these breastfeeding difficulties, what we usually do in the in the clinic most kids, most times, or we sometimes do this in the nursery as well, we'll basically sniff that little tie, and that'll release the tongue and allow it to move more freely. The procedure takes a few minutes. We do a snip. There's usually a little, bit of, a little bit of bleeding and we hold pressure on the site where we snipped for two to three minutes to stop any bleeding. And then we give the baby right back to mom and they can start uh, breastfeeding. So that's tongue tie. Now we're moving on to the airway and this is what a normal airway looks like. Mm. Mm. I'm gonna kind of jump ahead here. These are the vocal cords. So this is the one where I, I put a camera in the nose, looking down at the back of the throats and this is what, what it looks like when you're vocal, when you start talking. Um, this is your vocal folds actually produce a mucosal wave. All these other structures around the voice, their main goal is to protect the airway so that when you swallow food, food doesn't go down this pipe, it goes down the food pipe, which is, you can't see it up here, but it's at the top of the screen. It's right behind the window. So what are some common airway problems in kids? Laryngomalacia, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Vocal fold nodules, cysts or papillomas. And, and a lot of kids, especially two to four year olds, surprise, surprise, they put things in their mouths they shouldn't. And sometimes a kid can choke on different objects. Here we're removing, it was a weird piece of, this was a, I think a weird piece of plastic. And what we're looking at here is the airway. Let me back up a second so I can explain this more closely. This is the looking down into the windpipe. Down here is the left um, lung entrance, and this is the right lung entrance, and this is the midline. So this object went and blocked the right lung entrance completely, and under general anesthesia, we had to go and remove it. And I'll kind of jump ahead. This is it coming out. Sometimes they get pretty wedged in there. This is typically done without a breathing tube in place with a child under spontaneous ventilation. So they're, they're asleep, but they're breathing on their own without us uh, being through. Here's another example down here of a bead stuck in the, uh, in the child's airway. Now, the one thing that always, this is important for all parents, the one thing that we should always be aware of, all, all of these airway, all of these foreign bodies can be, um, are, are, are an emergency. But anytime a button battery is swallowed or, you know, or put in the nose, like you'll see in the next picture, 
that's an emergency because button batteries can burn a hole and burn pretty quickly through wherever it's lying, whereas these other things won't do that. You, if you hear a child or if you suspect a, a foreign body, the main thing you have to listen for is a wheezing child. And in some cases, they, they're in respiratory distress. But if they're making a funny breathing noise and you saw them put something in their mouth, they should be evaluated. Okay, here's some, uh, I skipped it. Here's some images of things we pulled out. This is a button battery in the nose. This is a comb pick that got stuck when a child was jumping up and down on the bed and it got stuck. It, this went through and through their soft palate. This is the x-ray. Uh, we basically just pulled it out and it was okay. And this is a video game that, from a Nintendo DS game that a child swallowed and it got stuck in their food pipe. And it was pretty big, about three and a half centimeters. So laryngomalacia. This is the most common cause of strider in infants. Now, strider is a very squeaky type of, new, of breathing. And uh, let's just play it. Now nah, he don't. <laughs> So this happens when these structures around the voice box, uh, it's basically from because they are floppy and not well formed when they're born. Uh, and as we get older, these structures around the voice box called the uh, epiglottis and the retinoids, they get more firm. But what happens is in children, this is an endoscopic view. In children, these, these uh, it's from these immature cartilage structures around the voice box. They will flop into the air, airway every time a patient with laryngomalacia takes a breath in because they're so floppy. When they flop into the airway, they narrow the airway. And when they narrow the airway, that's when you get that squeaky noise. Now, most kids will outgrow this by 12 to 18 months. And you, you know, and we don't have to do anything about it in most cases. I would say 90% of cases, no, no surgery is needed. But in 10% of cases that, in those patients that are failing to grow well or they're working significantly to breathe, like in this child on the left. In those cases, we actually have to go in and um, do a surgery to open up the airway. It's basically a, a few cuts to spring things open, if you will. This is most, you'll see this after, it usually presents around two to three weeks after a child is born. The most noisy that we'll get is around five months, but it can take up to 12 to 18 months to fully outgrow it so you don't hear that sound. And they outgrow it by those airway structures becoming more mature. The cartilage gets firmer. It doesn't collapse into the airway every time they um, take a deep breath in. So if, you have a, nah, he don't so if you have a squeaky baby, it's nothing to initially be alarmed about. But if they are working to breathe, if, they, if you see retractions like the, the chest being sunken in or you see um, the neck um, area being sunken in when they take a deep, deep breath in and they just don't look good, they should be evaluated. And of course, anything that makes you, any, you know, nervous at all, they should come in for evaluation. Uh, croup. This is a pretty common thing, especially this winter. This is a this is a viral infection of the area just below the vocal cords, which is already the most narrow area uh, in our airway, or it's, it's the most narrow area in a child's airway. So the area below the vocal cords is called the subglottis, and this is how a child with croup sounds. <laughs> Okay, so you have a barky cough, and again, it's, vi it's, it's viral in etiology, most commonly between 12 and, I would say, two to four years old, most commonly. And it, you have this type of strider or that squeaky noise that is present both with inspiration and on expiration. When we get an x-ray, we see an open airway column, but at the area below the vocal folds, we kind of lose the airway. We call this a steeple sign. Less than 10% of kids need to be hospitalized, but the ones that are significantly working, working at breathing, oftentimes do, and it's typically treat, it's, it's typically treated with nebulized epinephrine and steroids. So if you hear that barky cough, that's a good sign that your child has croup, and which is again, a viral inflammation of the area below the vocal folds. Usually time and sometimes medications, uh, like most with most viruses, you just need some time and medications to help speed it along. On another day, um, this is, these are discussions for another day. These are what vocal fold nodules look like. Nodules are very common 
and kids that scream a lot. Most commonly boys that are five years old are the classic age range. The more you scream, the more you improperly use your voice. Those vocal folds are just beating, you know, vibrating together improperly, and that's where you get nodules. These typically resolve with voice rest and sometimes voice therapy. This picture up here is an example of a papilloma, which is a benign lesion, but these are problematic and they tend to recur. So patients are treated with a combination of medications and surgeries. And if they're lucky, they need a few, like one or two surgeries. But in other cases, these patients have uh, papillomas all over the airway that require um, surgeries uh, on an every three, four, six month basis. I haven't had any patients with this in, uh, in South Lake Tahoe, but this is a common problem in Philadelphia for me. Other times, this is called subglottic stenosis. This is the area below, the, again, the vocal cords. And in patients that have had prolonged breathing tube placements, think patients that are born and placed in the NICU or the ICU, those prolonged breathing tube place treatments can lead to a narrow airway that needs surgical division. These are real pictures from uh, patients that I've dealt with. And, and I think, you know, this patient in particular was very interesting in that the patient was about one month old and they had persistent noisy breathing. They had a, a, a two week intubation um, in the NICU. And so they want us to evaluate the airway. We go in there and we take a look and we see this looking at us. And at first you're like thinking, what are those owl eyes? The breathing tube had created a scar band below the vocal folds but somehow he developed all of this as scar, except for those little holes. Those are his airways. His airway was, and each of those hole, holes are approximately two to three millimeters. So, you know, um, the patient required a tracheostomy. We had to come back and divide the scar bands. And we do different procedures to open up the airway so that, that those little holes are a bigger hole. And long story short, you know, the you know, the, we, we took the breathing, we took the end of the tracheostomy tube out a few, a few a weeks later and he had a normal airway. But in the middle of this, we had to convert this to an emergency procedure because this was a, you know, we, this was looking at, looking right back at us. You can't put a breathing tube through this because of how small it is. So we had to put a tracheostomy tube in, which is an incision in the neck to put a breathing tube in the neck, come back and deal with this. And then once this was all open, we were able to take the trach tube out. All right, so we're getting a little bit short on time, but we're, these are, there's lots of different neck masses we do deal with. Some are, some are at birth and some like this patient, like these are, this is a form of atypical um, tuberculosis. We saw these fairly commonly in San Diego, not so commonly here. There's different cysts, lumps and bumps. There's thyroid cysts and there's cysts that start from the mouth that proceed into the neck. Most common thing we see are, are lymph nodes that happen after like an ear infection or a tonsillitis. Those lymph nodes tend to be transient, uh, but for a lymph node that sticks around for a prolonged period of time and doesn't get smaller, sometimes we have to go and biopsy those. These things, you know, I haven't seen too many of them since I've been here, but these cysts in the neck generally require surgical excision. This is a case, and this is, you know, I probably shouldn't even put this one in the, in, in the slide, but th these are, there's severe cases where patients are born with these this is called a teratoma that required an emergency surgery so that the child could breathe. All right, so nosebleeds, a common subject, especially here in Tahoe. 90% uh, of nosebleeds happen from the front of the septum. And this is a picture kind of looking at the side view of the septum. The main point of this is showing that we have five blood vessels that come together in the front of the septum, right past where the skin meets the slimy part in the midline of the nose, five blood vessels come together. And so nose picking, nasal trauma, those are the, some of the big risk factors for kids and why they, why they get nosebleeds because they're scratching in that area. Also, we live in a dry climate. It's kind of like having a chapped lip inside your nose, but that area of chapping it is, is over an area of high vascularity. So we're seeing nosebleeds left and right here. And the majority of them stop on their own. And, or it's better, you can prevent nosebleeds with a combination of just keeping them moist, whether that's salt water gels, Vaseline, um, antibiotic ointments, those are all things that we place in the area to help prevent nosebleeds. But if a nosebleed does happen, um, you know, initially you just want to lean forward and pinch the soft, squishy part of the nose and tilt the head forward to put pressure on that septum. And patients are often referred to me though when they've had lots of ear, lots of not ear infections, when they've had lots of nosebleeds. In cases of patients with lots of nosebleeds, um, we sometimes have to burn the spot that's bleeding with either silver nitrate 
for electricity. And by burning that spot, it helps prevent the nose leaks. But, you know, leaks happen all the time. And usually we, a starting point is just using a humidifier, keeping the nose moist, telling a child not to pick at it. Um, but it's sometimes, again, we have to get referred here for cauterization. Um, so I think that's it. And we'll uh, pause and see if anyone has any questions. Yes, thank you so much. So informative. Um, just a reminder, if you do have questions, you can ask them in the Q&A box at the bottom or in the chat box. Um, you can ask questions anonymously if that's um, your preference. Um, the first question is, what types of symptoms do you have when you have a hole in the eardrum? You know, it, it kind of depends on how big the hole is. If it's a really small hole, you may not have any symptoms. The bigger the hole and the location of the hole can cause a can cause a hearing loss. And then with any water exposure, those ears tend to drain a lot more. So hearing loss and a draining ear, sometimes too, you can detect if you have a hole because you can perform a valsalva maneuver where you try and pop your ears and you will literally hear the air escaping. Um, so those are the two big ones, I would say, hearing loss and a draining ear. And then sometimes you can hear it too. Great, um, there's a question about um, at home earwax removal kits, is that something you recommend or is it best to see your provider? I, I, you know, so the ear canal is a very sensitive place and I should back up and say, we don't like patients putting even Q-tips in their ears because there's different kinds of earwax removal agents. So let me first and say like, not, don't put anything in your ear, nothing in your ear canals bigger than your, um, smaller than your elbow. So we don't like Q-tips, we don't like bobby pins to try and clean things out. Now, Debrox is the most common thing that patients often use, and that's those are earwax softening agents, like a hydroperoxide substitute. That will help soften earwax, and sometimes if there's only a small amount, will help dissolve it, and then you can irrigate it out with the irrigator that comes with it. But if there's a lot of earwax, that's not gonna do very much um, in an acute setting. So most of the time, there's also those ear, those ear candling things, and I've heard some, some bad story of people like burning their ears. So in general, I don't love like the, especially the ear candling instruments or the instruments where patients are digging out themselves because the outer third of the ear canal, it's not very sensitive, but the inner two thirds is, a, is basically bone. And that bone is very sensitive and it's, you know, it, it bleeds if you touch it, it's painful if you touch it. So sometimes patients get a little um, hyper-aggressive trying to clear their own ears. So in general, the candling and stuff, and the, the, the stuff where they're putting instruments in the ear, I don't like that. You Putting earwax drops like Debrox is okay to help loosen it up. And oftentimes I'll have patients do that before coming to see me because it helps the removal process because it helps slide out easier. So I hope that provides some help. But, you know, and in general, I don't love irrigation also. Irrigation can, is, has an association with causing holes in the eardrums if done improperly. And so when patients come in to see me, I just generally look under direct visualization and remove it. Okay, next question is, um, and I hope I pronounce this right. Does having a pre-arcular um, pits make you prone to ear infections? Hope I didn't picture that. Yeah. yeah. So pre-arcular pits are little dimples or holes. They're usually right in front of the ear, right in front of the, the pointy part of the ear. Uh, it's it, They can get infected when you, when the child gets infected or has a cold or a virus or whatever infection, but it's a different kind of ear infection. That's because that little pit leads to a tiny little, a little sac or a little cyst. And sometimes, you know, you have an ear infection if it's draining. And in some cases, those things can get big and red. So it, it does, it can, and in those cases, when it, you have recurrent drainage issues, we can actually surgically remove those pits under a general anesthesia. But it doesn't necessarily make you more prone to middle ear infections. It's just a different kind of uh, infection, usually you know that skin leading to the to that underlying cyst. Okay, and I think this is our last question. So if you're um, if you have a burning question, make sure to get it in. But this question is um, asking if tubes fall out before the nine month to sixteen month period, is it recommended to get them back in again? You no, know, the if they do, it, it depends if it's like, we, we, if it's like a few days afterwards, it really depends because really what happens is in most of those cases, we let the eardrum heal and then see what the ear does after that. 
if, if there's a child that gets lots of ear infections and we know their history, then we might be more likely to proceed with putting them back in. Other times we might just observe and see how they do. Uh, and if they keep getting more ear, ear infections. So the short answer is you don't have to right away, blanket saving, get it done right away. But if they continue to have ear infections with the tubes out, then they, yes, they need to be put back in. And it kind of depends on how much fluid and how many ear infections they were have going into the procedure to start with. I, I see there's also a question about if your station tube is blocked, how do you correct this? And well, the simple thing, if, if you think of anyone who has a cold and your ears feel closed, that's a form of the simplest form of eustachian tube dysfunction. So we um, salt water rinses, nasal steroids, sometimes oral steroids, all of these medications, they're, what they're trying to do is reduce the inflammation around the eustachian tube so that that eustachian tube can do its job of opening and closing. And that's the first line therapy. Now, most cases of eustachian tube dysfunction will resolve with time. So that ear fullness that you have after a cold, it will get better. But some patients it might take a week. Some patients it may take two to three months. And all those medications that I just talked about, whether it's oral steroids, nasal steroids, antihistamines, none of, not one of them is proven definitively to resolve eustachian tube dysfunction. So there's not one magic bullet. We still give them to try and reduce the inflammation and do something. But in the cases that don't fully resolve, that's where an ear tube like we do for children is an option. And, we're, and this is more kind of gearing a little more towards adults because this is a problem in children, but this is a little more um, in, patient, in adult patients. I'll see, oh, I, you know, my ear feels clogged after it's been like two weeks, three weeks, four weeks since I had an infection and it's still clogged. Well, again, we'll try all those medications, but in some severe cases where it doesn't improve, that's where an ear tube is an option. Or there's a newer procedure where we're actually passing a balloon into the nose, into the eustachian tube opening in the back of the nose dilating the eustachian tube. And by dilating that eustachian tube, um, we take the balloon out, of course, but hope, the hope is after we do the balloon dilation that the eustachian tube is functioning better. So that's a, that's a long conversation, but that's hopefully providing some a starting point. Great. Um, and we do have a couple other questions that have rolled in. So I'm gonna keep going if that's okay. Um, is tonsillitis a strep infection? Viral, there's viral infection, there's viral etiologies and bacterial etiologies. Strep is the most common form of, and, and strep is a bacterial infection. So strep means it implies bacterial, but there's different things that can cause it. So mononucleosis, that's a virus that can cause a bad case of tonsillitis. And if we think what tonsillitis is, it's just inflammation of the tonsils. So that can be bacterial, that can be viral, but again, the most common source is uh, strep. Are there natural ways to help repair hearing loss? You know, it depends on what kind of hearing loss we're talking about. You know, again, there's the conductive hearing loss and uh, branch, and then there's the nerve-related branch. I will say if it's nerve-related, uh, I think the most common form is an older individual, aging, loud noise exposure, acoustic trauma. In general, nerve-related hearing loss, there's not a good way to repair it. Um, as opposed to, I mean, there's, there's, there's options, but not nearly as many options for conductive hearing loss. The fluid in the ear, the wax impactions, the holes in the ear, the middle ear masses. It's easier to treat, and there's more treatment options for conductive hearing loss than there is nerve-related hearing loss. So it really has to do with what's the etiology of the hearing loss. Okay. Um, I think the last question is, is ear earwax removal by suction offered in your clinic? Yes, it is. We use a variety of instruments. We use curettes and suction. Basically, we use suction. The more liquidy it is, the more you can suction it away. And the more hard it is, the more you need different um, instruments to literally pull it out. So yes, we have suction. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Mantegui, for the wonderful presentation. Just a reminder that this will be available on our YouTube channel, um, as well as on Facebook. And there will be a um, survey that we welcome you to fill out just to leave feedback and provide um, topics for future webinars. Um, with that, I'll say good evening. Thanks again for being here. And thanks, Dr. Mantegui. Great presentation. Yeah, if you have any questions, reach out and or feel free, free to make an appointment. Sounds good. Have a good night. Thank you.